What's up you guys, Bart from TST Industries here. Welcome to TST Garage. Today with me in the shop, I have a XSR 900 and we're gonna be performing some magical things to it. We've already come out with a fender eliminator for this bike. It is basically one of the modules that is in the new kit that I'm gonna be showing you today. It's this assembly and it replaces some of this stuff here and uh, just requires some modification to the bike. We have since developed a new kit that has a fender eliminator and a integrated tail light, all plug and play, that will replace all this junk here and this round tail light. Now, some people may say, purists mainly, that this tail light embodies the design concepts that this bike was designed around. And that may be true for some people, but I have seen way more owners of this particular bike go away from this entire setup because mostly they do not like the look of the rounded tail light in the back and obviously everybody wants to get rid of these flicky pumpkins for uh, signals so we have a solution for you we have built a really nice integrated tail light fender eliminator kit that replaces all that stuff by replacing the entire carrying system for all these components. We've developed and injection molded this cradle that accepts one of these tail lights. The tail lights are available to you in a choice of clear or smoked lens. You make that decision when you purchase the product. The cradle just accepts the tail light and then we outfit you with a bracket that will carry your license plate bracket, your fender eliminator. You will have to make a decision whether you want our fixed angle bracket for the license plate or our adjustable bracket. The fixed angle bracket is a very simple and lightweight design. It's made of stainless steel, laser cut, and then powder coated black to blend with everything here that we've made super stealthy and just carries your license plate and possibly a license plate light if you've chosen to run that on the bike, but does that without the ability to change the angle at which the license plate hangs. Now our other setup, which is all billet aluminum, CNC machined, it is black anodized, it's really nice stuff. This actually has a hinge point here that you can unlock and change the angle of your license plate at any point. Now, as I mentioned, this module is already sold as a fender eliminator setup for these bikes. So some of you that may be watching this at this point have already purchased that. We've made another option available where we sell the entire kit here, but with no provisions for license plate mounting because you've already invested in those parts or perhaps maybe you're one of those people that have a low mount that you've made at home or procured from another company. That's cool too. We give you the ability to choose a package that works for you and not make you pay for things that you may not need. For this particular build, we're gonna choose the smoked tail light. I just feel like it's gonna go really nicely with all these components. I'm gonna put this guy away. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about is this assembly. Real quick, this is the built assembly. It appears at your door this way when you order it. It's a bag of parts. So I will first pre-assemble this in the installation segment and show you then how to put it on the bike if you've chosen this particular model, then it's pretty, pretty simple. It'll be the same assembly as for the more intricate model, but you'll just use the components that come with it here. And then subsequently, the extra fasteners that come with this bracket to screw this all together. And then all the rest of the steps will be the same. So in order to not provide redundant steps, we're gonna leave this one alone. It's so simple and follows basically the same procedure as this one, but without the necessity for building this module. Now, the other two things I wanna mention before we start wrenching, we do not sell a license plate light by default within this kit. I've come across numerous people that have decided not to run a license plate light. They're getting something that they're gonna to toss in the bin not use but have to pay for it so if you intend to use a license plate light with this setup please drop it in your cart ahead of time so that the parts that you want arrive at your door one other nuance i want to mention is the flash rig 
anytime you move away from using the incandescent type light bulbs in the OEM signals to LED signals, and we are doing that by moving to the signals that are on board this integrated tail light, you will experience something called fast flash, hyper flash, or many descriptions for it. The signaling system is essentially telling you that the current that is being drawn from the OEM flasher relay is lower than the threshold set on that system. And it's trying to alert you that something's off, something's wonky, all right? So typically, some people choose to wire in resistors to increase the current drawn by their, by their signaling system to fool the OEM relay into thinking that everything's cool. Uh, we don't like resistors around here. We do sell them because some people have kind of determined that this is the industry standard. We have a different standard. We have a replacement LED relay. There's an LED flasher relay. It replaces your OEM unit that is basically under the seat. It's very easy to get to. It's a two minute job. You take the seat off, put this in, boom, you're good to go. Now this restores the flash rate to 85 cycles per minute. If you don't like that flash rate, we do have a video performed on this bike showing you how to install this and also configure the flash rate if you'd like to change it. I typically just toss it in, keep it at 85 cycles per minute, but we believe that choice is freedom and we like to pass the freedom to you. So if you like to modify it, cool. If not, toss it in, good to go. Now, again, this is a separate part. Some of you guys out there that have bought our Fender Eliminator or maybe some technology from another brand, you may already have a solution to this. So it's not necessary to include it in this kit. And therefore, we pass on the savings of not including all these things to you. All right, I think my jaw is tired from all this yapping. I wanna grab some tools and let's go. Okay, step one will be to remove your license plate and retain the license plate hardware so that you can reuse all this stuff on the new setup that we will be installing on the bike. Then we will remove the seat. Now, when you lift up on the cover for the seat lock, take notice the actual lock cylinder is off center and therefore not concentric with the cover hole. When, when we install our components, that will remain the same way. Okay, now let's grab an eight millimeter socket and pull out these four fasteners and then subsequently this bracket. We'll put that off to the side. We have just gained ourselves access to all the wiring that will need to be disconnected. We are removing the entire fender off the bike, so that means all the lighting has to come out with it. We have this set of connectors here. That's the license plate light. It's a very simple connector. You pry up on this locking feature, pull them apart, and that disconnects them. Same concept here, they're just reversed. So the male is on this side and female on this side. Same concept, pull up and disconnect. And now we could unroute these wires from the cable management system here. Now we have the tail light connector. It does get secured to the sub tray here. We can remove it, but it's not really necessary. We can just press on this locking tab until it unlocks and withdraw it. And now all of our wiring's loose. I'm gonna switch over to a 10 millimeter socket and remove these four nuts here. Now I'm gonna do three all the way out and then do this one last as I hold the fender so that it doesn't just drop off. Once all those fasteners are loose, this thing will just drop down. So just carefully milk out the wires through this rear hole. And now we can go over to the table and disassemble this unit. Okay guys, my method of approach here for the next couple of steps will be to disassemble this assembly, the fender assembly into subcomponents and keep only the ones that we're gonna be reusing for our new TST industry setup and bin the rest of these parts. So we'll start here by removing this 10 millimeter fastener using a 10 millimeter socket again. 
nut goes away, but we're going to retain this bracket. All right, let's flip this thing over. We're going to remove this shroud here. You can use a Phillips or a small flathead. These are quarter turn rivet fasteners. If they do spin, if the entire thing spins, you have to hold the rim. And that lets the head pop up. Now you just pull them out and those go in the bin. Now here, as you can see there are indentations on the body of this shroud that lead to little clip fasteners. We're gonna squeeze that and pop it out. The one on this side first. Squeeze them on both sides and try to clear that from the captive window down there. All right, I popped both sets out actually, and now this needs to slide towards this edge of the fender, and that just clears it. We're gonna keep this, and now we just continue working. At this point, we have to take out the tail light. This tail light inhibits our ability to remove the outer fender that we will be keeping. So the tail light does have to come out. We have this cable management clip here that has dual closure that comes together like that with ratchets. We're going to have to clear that out. Now, if you do end up damaging this, it is not a part that gets reused. So technically that's pretty okay. All right, it's also a clamshell design. Once you open it, it just stays together. This white three conductor plug is the one that we're gonna concern ourselves with. Once this is clear, pretty much good to go. There are two additional 10 millimeter nuts here. I'm gonna remove those. Now we can remove the tail light and the tail light goes away into the bin. The nuts also go away. Let's flip this assembly over. Now, as you can see, this outer fender is pretty much good to come off the exception of having to remove these four fasteners. We use a T20 Torx bit on these. Now, technically, we could possibly reuse these for our TST industry setup. However, these are made of aluminum. So I don't think that they are going to withstand the trials of time. Please just use the screws that we've provided in our kit for these locations, and I'll show you that in the next couple steps. So this fender has to clear these five fasteners as well as this mounting point for the tail light. Take that off. Keep that and this whole thing goes away. Here's a quick note for you guys here in front of me. You see that cable shroud that we took off and retained. This is the only part on the entire bike that needs to be modified for the purpose of assembling our new setup. Now, this is only, this only really applies if you choose to keep it. Now I know from my experience over the years, many, many people like to retain some kind of coverage over their key cylinder so that debris and rain doesn't get in there. Um, I typically just use WD-40, shoot it in there once in a while, and I keep them open. Other bikes do have them facing the ground and they don't have any shrouds, but you know, the choice is really yours. Uh, we will put a little hole here. We will do a little slice here. A couple little things to make this actually fit with our new setup here. I'll illustrate why. When this is assembled, this whole setup is way too long. If you remember where we took this off from, that would interfere with this component here. So we are gonna have to trim it and then we're gonna put a mounting hole in here. Now, if you decide to get crazy hands and slip and mess this thing up, 
I actually bought several of these from partzilla.com. They were $6.32 each. If you do mess up and do want to replace it, it's really, really cheap. It's also available at MR Cycles and any other place online that sells OEM components. They're very cheap, don't worry about it. And like I said, if you end up not running it, just jam WD-40 up in that lock and be good to go. If you guys have seen any of my other videos that require any kind of modification, you already know that I'm a big proponent of using painter's tape as a marking device. If you don't have painter's tape or any other tape that you may want to use, you can just mark right on the object here in front of us. But this also gives me nice contrast to show you guys what I'm trying to do here. First things first, let's identify some parts here. I'll show you a pre-modified part that I hacked up over some time in the R&D process. We want to be left with roughly this amount of material here. So all of this is going to go away. For that, we'll need to identify this plateau here. Go from the key cylinder cover down this area and identify this area here. When it meets the set of features that have the locks here, we are going to place a datum, datum line here. So I'm basically trying to make this corner here between these two surfaces my datum. And that is just the place where I'm going to measure from. I'm going to try to get as precise as I can with the straight edge here, place it in the corner at the intersection of those two surfaces. Okay, so this is my datum. Now, measuring away from all of this, I'm gonna measure from, from the datum down to here. What we want is roughly 20 millimeters, or that will roughly translate to 13 sixteenths. Now, if you have a caliper, this is a perfect time to use it. If you don't, you will just need some kind of a scale that is graduated in sixteenths so that you can mark off the next set of points. Like I said, I like the precision of a caliper, so I'm gonna set it to 20 millimeters. And I'm going to mark from the datum down to here. And then also on the other side. And now I can use another piece of tape across those marks using the flat long side of the tape. That'll mark where we're gonna cut this piece to discard this side and keep this side. Now, we can't really cut it on a right angle here. We're gonna have to follow this. We're gonna have to follow this line just offset by the same amount as we measure from here to here. So you can possibly just eyeball it. It's most likely precise enough if you just connect the vertex here to the area down here following this line parallel to this line, or you can measure it out. I'm comfortable just cutting it just by eyeballing it because I've done it several times now. I'm gonna do that on both sides of this part. And now the last thing to do is to determine where to place our little hole here. There is an injection gate mark right here in the center of a box. So again, in reference to the key cylinder cover, I want to go down to the box to the center and go down to the bottom line here and place a hole here. I'm going to mark that again just because I like to mark all my stuff. Make sure that we are actually on center with this mark. And there you have it. So we have one area of modification here and one cut to do here. Therefore, this is redundant and we don't need to consider this anymore. All right, what to do first? Well, I have my drill ready to go. 
So I'm gonna drill this hole first. Now what we wanna do is put a six millimeter hole in here. Six millimeters is roughly 15 sixty-fourths. So if you're working with SAE tools, choose 15 sixty-fourths. This is the drill, the final drill size. I do like to put a pilot hole in there so that a larger bit doesn't walk around and get off center. Also like to work over wood in case I penetrate and it just drops to the bottom. I don't wanna hurt my work surfaces here. I get a good bite on this material first by hand. Then we are drilling into polypropylene. You will wanna walk on you a little bit if you just go aggro. Uh, look at that. I just got right through by hand. You could potentially go several sizes until you reach your six millimeter hole. I'm just gonna go straight to it. I feel pretty confident that this time. I'm gonna be able to stay center. And boom, there you have it. That's done. I'm going to peel off this tape and focus mainly just on that cut. At this point, we'll have to decide what tool to use to make this cut. This is polypropylene. It cuts very, very easily. We have two weapons that we can possibly choose from here. We have a rotating disc cutter on a Dremel or a very sharp blade. Since I like to show these installations with the simplest tools, I'm gonna to attempt to do it with just a blade. You can potentially make use of this, but it's gonna spit a lot of material out. It's gonna eventually melt it melt it through so make sure you protect your eyes and your body whichever way you go about it all right now to make a straight cut i'm gonna need a straight edge so i'm gonna go with my scale here lay it flat on this surface and start making this cut now i'm not going to attempt to cut all the way through right away Gonna keep making passes. And a groove will form. And now I'll be able to penetrate all the way through. Now here's another advantage of making this cut with a blade. Once it's through, it's through. We don't really have to finish it off. If you're using a disc cutter, chances are it's gonna be a very melty edge that then you have to go and clean up with files or sandpaper or something like that. So consider that before you choose how you're gonna do this. All right, so that was pretty simple. I got through pretty quickly. Now it's just a matter of getting this slice here. Now I could do it with the straight edge or I could do it very carefully by hand and lay my first groove that I will then subsequently follow. Obviously you want to make sure you're not holding it some way like this and cutting towards your hand. That's just common sense but I figured it was noteworthy. All right one last cut here and we'll be off to the races. All right, simple as that. Just gonna drag my blade along the edge here to remove any burrs that may still be hanging around. Now we have a nice clean cut, so when we go to assemble all of these components, they will actually fit together really well. We do have accepting features here that will capture this part like so and place it basically with the dimensions I gave you for the cut will be placed where it needs to be placed to replicate the placement of this hole in respect to our key cylinder. All right, let's grab the rest of the parts that we'll need for the assembly of what needs to go back on the bike and then we'll continue. Now, before we go any further with the installation of all these components, I wanted to give you guys a set of proper tools for selecting the appropriate hardware for appropriate uh, bolted connections. So 
The next couple steps, we'll just identify the differences in all these fasteners that you see here and we'll show you where they go. Let's start with the nuts. There's only one type of nut in this entire kit. There are five of them. This nut and the really long screw are gonna go with this component here and that will be installed later. Now you have four rubber washers, the only black rubber washers that exist in this kit. There you go with this component and we also need the rest of the four nuts and these M5 machine screws to go here. Now you are presented with several different types of screws. You can tell here, this is a machine thread. It's five millimeter diameter. If you compare it to this screw, this screw is longer and also smaller in diameter and also has a smaller tool that fastens it. So these go with all these components. And now we have these remaining machine screws with the two shiny flat washers. Now these will be used to fasten your license plate bracket through here. Whether you've chosen the adjustable or standard, this will be the same procedure. Washer, screw, and then your license plate bracket goes on the bottom of this. So we'll put this to the side. We already cleared that away. Now we're presented with the rest of these components. These are self-threading trilobular plastite screws. They're specifically made for fastening into thermoplastics. And guess what? The other side of the connection is a thermoplastic housing of a tail light. These will have to go through these washers and we just need to make sure that they go through the appropriate side. Once the head penetrates through, we want it to be flat with the rounded component or rounded feature of this washer. So that's how we will stack them up. And these will be responsible for clamping all of this together. Basically go from the back of our cradle. There will be three of them, obviously. Then we have our license plate bracket carrying L bracket. And then our tail light. I'll show you the sequence of how that actually gets fastened because it's not just stacking it up, but I just wanted to identify all the components before we go together. Now here you see a sub harness that goes with our tail light. We manufacture this tail light for several different uses. So to make sure that you guys don't have to splice anything, we make a vehicle specific sub harness that connects to this large six position plug and on the other side, the bike side, terminates in, guess what? Yamaha specific connectors, signals and taillight. So we can go ahead and plug this together, make sure it makes a little snapping noise. This is ready to go. And then we've also provided you with two wire ties. I'll show you how to use them a little bit later. All right, let's now proceed to the actual assembly of the components. Let's now assemble our cradle onto our outer fender. You can see four holes that will align with these four holes. Put it in like so, and then advance it towards the rear. And then we'll grab these fasteners that we've chosen for this step and put the head of this screw to the outside of the fender on each one of these locations and then use the rubber washer and one of these M5 nylock locking nuts to cap that off. We'll do that on every location. All right, these are stamped components made out of aluminum. They are stamped by a superior company, Yamaha. However, they are a stamp component and aluminum itself has different springiness in different samples of the sheet. So to combat gaps here on the side, we actually made, we, we gave our holes in the cradle just a little bit of tolerance so that you can adjust fore and aft just a little bit here before you clamp down totally. 
and make sure that you're not producing a gap here. So I'm going to grab a three millimeter Allen and an eight millimeter box wrench and I will get these things seated down. We are, we are tightening this through a set of rubber washers. So there will be friction there. I don't want to tighten too, too far. It'll be difficult to move this around and adjust it. So we just want to make everything be in contact, then make the adjustments and then lock it down. And again, we are going through rubber washers. We do want to squash them a little bit and preload the connection when we get to that point. But we also don't want to over tighten on it. The tightness of these fasteners does not matter for possible loss of fastener due to vibration. They are locking nuts, so they will not really loosen. All right, so I do still have a little bit of movement, but I've adjusted it. I've adjusted the tightness of my fasteners in a way that they'll stay put after I adjust it. That's all good with the exception of this one. All right, here we go. So I'll be able to adjust it just a little bit here. Make sure both sides don't produce a large gap. Now I can bring these fasteners to full tightness. And that just means I'm going to preload my rubber washers. All right, for the duration of this next couple steps, we're done with those tools. We're pretty much just going to use these and also a Phillips screwdriver. Now we have our cradle attached to the outer fender. Now we will need to attach our license plate bracket carrying L bracket, and then also our, our tail light. So for this purpose, if you are choosing the standard license plate bracket, it's gonna be very simple. This, these are the components that come with the license plate bracket. We've already pre-configured the screws that interact with all of these components here. Next step would be get your bracket on here and drop some washers on here and the nuts go on. And then we perform an adjustment to make sure this is center and adjusted properly to your liking and then you lock it down. If you're going with our adjustable setup, then at this point, you would already have this configuration built that has accepting threads here. So we would dab a little bit of thread locking compound on these threads, bring this down, get the threads engaged and go on from there. Now, obviously this doesn't arrive to you in this form. We do have an appendix chunk at the end of this video showing you the procedure for building this configuration out of the parts that come in the assembly. All right, since these are vastly the same, a couple different nuances here, I'm just gonna put one on here. I do prefer our billet aluminum CNC machined setup. So I'm gonna work with that. This is a medium strength thread locking compound. I'm gonna get some of this stuff on the threads here in these connections. This just ensures that as you ride down the road tomorrow and in several years, these, these parts stay put. They don't just vibrate off. If you do not put it on there, you run the risk of losing your stuff. All right, so these bosses are threaded we align the thread, use a four millimeter Allen to start the thread. All right, so this bracket actually is slotted. This affords you adjustment fore and aft. I like to stick these license plate brackets all the way out, that's just my choice. So I'm just gonna pull it all the way towards the rear and then lock it down. Just know that once 
once this whole setup goes behind the tail light, you would have to remove it to readjust this. So you have to make your choice or live with the fact that you may have to take it off if you want to change it. And just know that taking it off the bike is actually still pretty straightforward. So no big deal there. Now we have the license plate bracket module. We have our tail light module, fender module, and we have all the fasteners here. Let me grab a Phillips so we can move forward. Here I'm using a number two Phillips screwdriver. We have a slot and a larger hole here to house the grommet for the wiring. I'm gonna pass, that, pass the wire through and get her tail light sort of in position. This gap here will close, but before we do that, we will need to sandwich this setup here. Now again, it has this slot for the grommet and it has all the three holes for our fasteners. And again, it is slotted to afford you a little bit of adjustability should you choose to take it. I have these fastener pairs that I made with the finishing washers. As you turn these screws in, you are forming brand new thread in the housing of the taillight. Make sure that you're careful about this. We've used this type of a fastening system on many, many systems, even on bikes that are ridden really roughly in, uh, in rough terrain. We've had really good success with no breakage. So there's proof there. You just have to be careful not to over tighten these. So the proper adjustment procedure here is to get these snug, but keep just a little bit of adjustability in the entire system so we could make sure everything's hanging uh, level, center, all that good stuff. And like I mentioned in, in a previous step, it's not that big of a deal to loosen everything up and readjust it, but I do like to have my steps as efficient as possible. All right, so here we will need to make sure that we're not producing a giant gap between the lens and the outer uh, fender, but also we do not want too much contact here between those components. So I like to pull the taillight down in the slots as much as possible. It'll produce probably like a two millimeter gap and that's good enough for us. And then the other choice you have to make is how far down you want this to stick. Now, you can push the bracket in as far as it'll go on the slots. There's not that much adjustability in there, but again, we like to pass the choice to you. Once you have it adjusted to your liking and you've produced the appropriate gap in the tail light against the fender, go ahead and lock it down. pretty good to me. Now, if you were running a license plate light, and ultimately we will put a license plate light on this bike, but for the simplicity of showing you demonstration that applies only to these components and not making it super convoluted, we've chosen to do only these steps. We do have a separate video showing you how to install a license plate light generally on any bike. You basically sandwich it in between your license plate and your bracket. You run the wiring in. You most likely want to use wire ties or some sort of cable management system to run it along the same wire that goes inside the bike. And it's really, really simple. Like I said, we do have separate videos demonstrating that, so I will not overcomplicate this procedure. Let me just keep on moving here. We do have a really, really long wire here. And we have this bulky plug. This will need to be housed inside this handy cable shroud. Now, if we just S-fold a bunch of these cable sections like this and basically just leave another I don't know, two inches exposed. 
our handy cable tie that comes with this kit will enable us to bunch this all up and we can tie it down and have a nice little package that goes within that cable shroud. All right, so we end up with this kind of a setup. This will go inside the bike and have plenty of length to mate with the receiving connectors. And now this little amount of bulk will be housed like so in this shroud. And like I showed you before, we do have receiving geometry for this end of our modified shroud. So let's get that on there right now. And I'm just gonna make sure that this cable with all the wires from the tail light goes into one of these receiving features that were meant for the signaling system on the bike previously. And now there's one more component that we have to put on top here and interface everything so that we could go back to the bike and install this on the bike. The wires and the cable will have to go through the larger area here in this bracket. And now this will be a little tricky because we have to interface these winged sections these features here will have to interface with this bracket and then we're going to have to keep it in place as we bring it over to the bike. So I basically just flex that shroud very gently, make sure I don't distort anything. The plastic can distort if you're, if you're too tough on it. So I just move around the entire bracket and the, and the shroud until I find a way for that to click in together. All right, so now you just need to make sure that our holes, our mounting holes in the fender to the bike are actually concentric with the bracket that this shroud's attached to. If they are not, that means that you didn't shave enough off of the back interfacing area here that interfaces the shroud to our cradle. If your holes are not lining up exactly concentric here for these fasteners, please take this off and refine the cut, cut off just a little bit more. And then once you put it back in, make sure that these are concentric. So you can see here, mine are concentric. So we're gonna keep moving forward. I'm gonna grab the fasteners that we set aside before. That long M5 countersunk screw goes through the hole that we drilled through the shroud. Be careful as you penetrate here, have to make sure that you actually get around all of the wires. There's a bulk of wires in there. I think it's a little easier if we move them aside here, make, make space for this screw with a screwdriver. And then the idea is to penetrate the, the, the outer um, fender And also, this outer bracket, and now we just cap it off with our nylock locking nut. I'm gonna use a eight millimeter here and a three millimeter Allen. Now this is not a bolted connection that needs to be super, super tight. Basically just trying to make sure that this component stays intact with the rest of the assembly. So what I am going to do is penetrate through the top of the nut and make sure that only one thread sticks out past. So flush to one thread is fine. Don't make it any tighter than this. All right, guys, we are almost there. If you bear with me for a couple more moments, we'll be 100% done. This whole unit is done. We need to get some fasteners to fix it to the frame of the bike. We're gonna resurrect this assembly from the bin that we've dumped it in. And also, if you remember, this thing was attached to the bike via these acorn nuts. We are going to actually use these acorn nuts in the next step. Here we have four black fasteners with these silver tea washers in there. We are going to scavenge those as well.
All right. I got four T washers here, shoulder washers, four screws, and four acorn nuts. This thing can go back in the bin. Configuration for the mounting of this fender assembly to the bike will be T washer with the smaller diameter down, larger diameter interfacing the inner part of the fender. Then the screw will go through that. This entire assembly with four sets of this hardware will go through the frame. And on top of the frame, we're gonna cap it off with this acorn nut on each one of these. Let's perform that now on the bike. First, we will feed the wiring with the connectors first through the hole that all of the fender lighting components go through. And then carefully align that screw that needs to protrude through these mounting holes and thread on the acorn nut. I will repeat this step exactly the same for all four of these. Now using a four millimeter Allen on the screw heads below, 10 millimeter socket on top. I'll tighten these guys down all the way. Maybe as I come close to the bottom, I'll make sure that things straight here, but it's not a lot of adjustment that can be made here, but it does rotate quite a bit about the center axis here. So you wanna make sure that your fender is in line with the center plane of the bike. Uh, in this step, we're basically just gonna route the wires here and make sure we can plug everything in. I'm gonna go with the main three conductor connector first. Make sure it makes a little audible noise. And uh, then we have to connect signals. Typically, instead of giving color codes, I run one of the signals and plug my signaling system in until I get the appropriate response. And here I plugged it in backwards. All right. I have left signal initiated and the left signal is actually lit up. So this will be good to go here. After that, it's basically just bulk distribution for the wires. You actually have plenty of room inside that shroud down there, so you can stuff it down there so you don't have a lot of stuff going on here in this compartment. Should you ever choose to do one of our TST Industries brake light modulator, this keeps the bulk out of here and you can actually mount it here, connect it through here, and you won't have a big bulky mess. Now, do you wanna draw your attention to the fast flash here? The signal on this bike is actually flashing very fast. And that was the symptom I was talking about in my intro. That's usually called hyper flash. For the purpose of combating that, we would now change this component here. This is our flasher relay. Although this is not the installation video for the flasher relay, I'll show you just how easy that is. Unplug it, plug this guy in and we're back to proper flash rate. Then you just strip off this rubber keeper that is a suspension mechanism for keeping your relay on the frame, on the bike. Get the rubber keeper onto your relay and then slip this over its receiving tab here. And that's that. I'm gonna keep this on the bike because it's gonna stay with it. All right, let's get our seat latch bracket back in place. The window, the actual lock goes to the left. I'm gonna switch to my eight millimeter socket for this next step and tighten all these guys down.
Now the seat just pops on. And that's pretty much it. We're gonna jump down below, tighten up some stuff and we'll be good to go. Let's now perform some final adjustments and tightening in our pre-assembly of all these adjustable fender eliminator components. We left some of the fasteners loose. These brackets are meant to be adjustable side to side, but we are kind of tapped out on the range here. So we're actually fixed where we're supposed to be. So I'm actually gonna make that connection all the way tight. And then I had the hinge points temporarily fastened to prevent this being very cumbersome. So I'm gonna unlock the hinge point, enabling this adjustability. And I don't wanna be steering blind here. So I'm gonna grab my license plate and see where I wanna place it, or rather at which angle. Don't want it down here because the suspension travel will likely be long enough to hit your license plate, bend it on there, probably crack something. You want to be in this range here from this angle up. I mean, technically, the features of this system enable you to do this, but cop gets behind you, probably not going to like that. So let's keep it nice and legal over here. I like this angle. It is roughly looking like a 90 degree angle between my L brackets and my hinges. I'm going to lock that down. Quick note, hold the bracket as you tighten it. You don't want to be torquing the entire cradle. You may damage it if you do it the other way. All right. Now we're ready to put the license plate on. Just wanted to make a couple notes for you guys that are gonna be running a license plate light. If you're running the license plate light, it gets routed through here, on top of this bracket, over to this, the back compartment here. It gets sandwiched by the license plate and the license plate bracket. The rest of the instructions are in our license plate light instructional video. You would probably just route it the same way you routed your wires through the whole thing. And uh, just a quick, another note, uh, in the intro you saw two of these included in the kit. I actually, during the shoot of this video, determined that it'd be better to have one of these for the underside and a smaller one here that you can loop around and pass through this little slot system that we have in our intermediate bracket for holding the license plate bracket that enables you to tie off your license plate light to this bracket. As you can see here, we have those slots already in there and we already have the little zip tie holding the license plate light wire to it. That just makes your cable management really nice and things won't be just hanging around. All right, all the notes aside, we are pretty much done here. I'm gonna put my license plate back on and that'll be that. Typically we instruct our customers to just reuse the hardware that they already have with their original license plate setup. If you do not have those anymore, these reflector uh, hardware kits are available on our web store. We also have these anodized aluminum countersunk washer sets uh, with a nut and a washer for the underside. These exist in blue, silver, red, I believe gold anodized. We have several colors. If that interests you, we already have that up on the site. You could just drop that in your cart along with these parts. Um, pretty much done here. I'm gonna give it a once over, make sure everything is working properly. Beautiful. Signals are working. So this is done. I'm gonna clean up and we are done. Check it out, you guys. We ditched this four and a quarter pound behemoth with squiggly pumpkins for this classy looking 
awesome tail setup. If you notice, we actually worked in some of the body lines of the bike into the entire assembly. The nuances from how these lines come together into the fender are carried over into our design. And then we have this nice integrated tail light that has a ducted shape. The perimeter is the running light and the center turns on for braking. Obviously it's an integrated tail light, so the signals are in the capsule. And you also have a really nice, slim, stealthy license plate holder. This is how we do things here at TSC Industries. Uh, if you like what you see here, we have a bunch of parts for this bike. Maybe you have some other bikes for which we may also have parts on our website. Check out tscindustries.com. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the notification button. That way we'll see you in the next one. Peace. Okay, the following will be the appendix that I promised you guys concerning how to pre-build this set of parts into a pre-configured assembly that then gets assembled onto this system. We just showed you how to assemble onto the bike. We are going to empty all the parts that come in the kit and we will situate the subcomponents in a certain way. You have your flat bracket and then you have these L brackets. If you notice, they are not the same. They are actually mirror image of each other. What you want to do is have the slotted surface sitting up and the surface with the hole behind it like this, sloping down. Imagining this is the rear of the motorcycle. I'm the front. They will be sloping towards the rear. Situate them so that these, hole, these slots align with the innermost holes. And then we have these hinge points here. Now, take a look here. They actually have a straight side and a curved side. The curved side goes to the rear of the bike. So we will situate them like this. And then we have several fasteners. The nuts go behind these brackets. We have countersunk screws and button head screws. The countersunk screws go in the front here or to the rear of the motorcycle actually, front you guys. And we have the button head screws with the washers that pre-assemble onto the washers and those will fasten the L brackets onto our hinges. So I've just spatially configured our setup here in the direction that it's gonna go. I'm gonna start with the hinges and the L brackets. You can see there is a small protruding boss from the hinge that interfaces internally with the hole on the L bracket and that permits it to be an actual hinge. We will insert these screws in here. Before we do that, I want to urge you guys to use at least a medium strength thread locking compound on these threads. If you do not use thread lock, you will likely, you will stand the chance of actually losing this hardware. Now you can't possibly tighten it enough to prevent vibratory removal. I do like the comfort of knowing that my parts are protected in the configuration that I left them in by using thread locking aging. So really urge you guys to use some kind of a thread locking method. Repeat this on the other side. These screws take a four millimeter Allen. I go all the way to the bottom and then I back it off just a little bit. I like to have a little bit of adjustability here. And now we can get our main bracket 
onto the L bracket via the screw from the outside and then this flange nut on the inside. Now this connection does not require a thread locking agent because it has a nylock locking element in the nut itself. Once you thread that on and tighten it, that's it. It won't vibrate off. Get it in by hand, then use a three millimeter Allen from the outside and an eight millimeter open-ended from the inside. Again, I'm gonna go almost to the bottom or all the way to the bottom and then back off just to have a little bit of adjustability here. I do want it to be tight enough so that as I move it around and assemble other parts with it, I don't have a sloppy mess, but it just makes it so much easier to have it just a tiny little bit loose and be able to alter its um, configuration without having to use tools. So, I give it just a little bit of freedom and then once it's on the bike and configured with everything else, I give it a final tightening. Now I will repeat the steps with all the other components. Tighten down on the hinges a little bit. Like I said, we don't want a sloppy mess here. And that's really easy to get to at the very end to tighten and adjust. So now I've shown you how to successfully pre-assemble this module and now you'll be able to install it as one of the uh, license plate bracket modules with the kit I just showed you how to install.